Good evening, friends. Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. Here's some more of that nice jazz bumper music to carry us through to folks logging into our Facebook Live broadcast tonight. Welcome to the Daily Update. Uh, a couple of jokes tonight. We've had our old recliner for many years, and it's uh, starting to get threadbare. I think it might be time to replace it, but it's going to be really hard because that recliner and I go way back. I'm thinking of dressing up as a Band-Aid this year for Halloween, but I don't think I can pull it off. And there are your jokes for October the 29th, 2020. News, unless you have been on the moon or on a desert island, you probably know that the world is going through a pandemic surge right now, the autumn surge, which was predicted. Uh, the United States is uh, over 225,000 dead now and having record numbers of new infections every day. In North Carolina, we have 4,200 dead at this point. That's about 20 times the normal death rate from the flu. So bad times, uh, just remember again to wear your mask, wash your hands, and wait at least six feet apart. Do the things that you can do to keep others safe. Our reopening task force, the governor spoke last week, and I think he spoke again this week. I'm trying to remember it may have been Tuesday. But our reopening task force met Monday night and deliberated for over an hour and decided that we would host a town hall gathering on Zoom last night which lasted about an hour. We had I, My count was total number 42 people uh, who signed in. I was hoping to have more, but we had 42 people who had the opportunity to, to listen, to voice concerns, to ask questions. And uh, the reopening task force is in the process of discernment and will issue a document next week for the church. I want to thank all of those who participated last night for being a part of this process that we believe is spirit guided to try and help us be as safe as we can do and still keep our church as open as we can. The fall festival is coming up Saturday, it's supposed to be a beautiful, cool day, so it'll be all hands on deck for a drive through, socially distanced event. There may still be some things that need to be done. If you want to help, call Stacy Thomas or Doug Harwood or contact them on uh, email and uh, find out what's ne what else is th to be done. Worship Sunday is supposed to be outside at 11. Slight possibility of rain. It will be cool. Bring a blanket if you want to. You can sit outside your car. You can sit in your car. Wear your face mask at all times outside of your car. Bathrooms in the church will not be open. And you will be directed to a parking space to keep people spaced apart in the parking lot. The last time we did this, we had about 70 people. And people behaved like they were supposed to. So let's hope that we can keep that up. And uh, I hope that I will see you. Normally, we would do an All Saints service on the first Sunday in November, but this year, because of the election coming up on Tuesday, I want to do a sermon about Christians and politics. Um, and I bet you're dying to hear what your pastor is going to say about that. So that'll be this coming Sunday, and then Sunday the 8th, we will do an All Saints celebration. So I'll go ahead and put my pitch out, and then we're going to send out a church chat. I would love to have pictures of your loved ones who died in the past year. Just in the past year, if you, uh, we've had three church members uh, just since the quarantine began. 
and there, others have lost family members and friends. If you could send some pictures to the church office or to me at my email address, rvspivey314 at gmail.com, we'll put them in a nice slideshow and do a song to go with them and have a, a little video during the service on the 8th of November for All Saints. So we'll put that out in a church tab, but we're looking for pictures to do a remembrance for our loved ones and friends who have passed away. Updates for today, and there's quite a few. Continue to remember those who have lost loved ones, as I just mentioned. Uh, folks who are recovering from surgery right now, uh, a member of our church had cataract surgery today. I do not know how they are doing. I haven't heard. Doug Pettigo continues to recover from surgery, our former choir, our choir director. Uh, Iris Sinzig is having some trouble walking and has to have an MRI next week. I saw this on her Facebook page, so we want to lift Iris up. Um, when she was at our meeting last night, would never have known from looking at her, her, uh, her sweet face that she was in a lot of pain. Uh, so pray for all of those that you know in our congregation who are going through hard times with their health right now or any other hard times. Uh, pray for our shut-ins. We want to lift up those who have been affected by COVID-19 and the numbers are staggering. I have another colleague who has it. I just found out another one of another pastor, another friend of mine who has it. And also heard that the young grandson of a young adult grandson of a former church member has COVID-19. And we want to continue to pray for our country as we wrap up the end of this election season and the rhetoric and the ugliness heats up. And I pray for a day when we can go back to a time when election season was not as awful. It's never been great, but it's, it's been so awful the last two elections. I hope we can get back to a different time. The reflection for tonight comes from Robert Fulgham, who you may know, he wrote several books. His first one was called All I Really Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten, and another one was It Was on Fire When I Laid Down on It. Um, his work reminds me a lot of Regina Bretts that I've been reading to you. He is, in fact, a minister, an ordained Unitarian Universalist minister. And uh, I was, what came to mind was we had our virtual choir practice last night at 645. Thank you, Brittany, for setting that up. And this is a meditation tonight about music and singing. Imagine how it would seem if our educational system evaluated students around sixth grade and if you didn't have a clear potential for playing tennis at a Wimbledon championship level, the school and the parents would say, you are not now and never will be a tennis player, and that would be the end of tennis for you. No way. We think of sports as a lifetime activity essential to good health. We think that it's important that people play tennis or golf or basketball or hockey or at least run or walk at whatever level they can for their own good as long as they can. We don't eliminate organized sports around sixth grade for everybody except those who have the talent and potential for excelling to the point where they could make a professional career of it. That would be absurd. And yet, when it comes to singing, that's exactly what we do. From sixth grade through high school, for the rest of your life, if you haven't been labeled as having talent or a good voice, or if you aren't stubborn about it, you will not sing in the chorus. And you will grow up at best being a secret singer, as embarrassed to be caught singing in public as picking your nose. And this is true because it's difficult to get folks to sing in our choir and our praise team at church. If you want to clear a room full of guests at a party, simply announce that we're all going to gather around the piano and sing songs. Good night. People will make self-deprecating statements about their vocal inadequacies and they'll head for the kitchen or the bathroom or just go on home. Same is true on a camping trip. Let's all sit around the campfire and sing since most people into their tents in a hurry, unless they're old people who were around before radio or TV or stereos and don't know any better, but there are fewer of us every day. As a high school teacher, I was struck not only by how few students thought of themselves as capable of singing, but how popular lip syncing to recorded music was. If there was any so-called singing at a talent show, it was most likely this silent semi-ventriloquism accompanied by air guitar, mimic music, we call it karaoke, of course, not the real thing. On hiking trips with adolescents, campfire singings consisted of parody bits and pieces of songs from the radio and MTV. Without the record, the music died. They didn't even know any hymns from church. They didn't go to church. Lest this seem like a things ain't what they used to be diatribe from somebody with old geezer tendencies, I insist that singing is as basic to being human as walking upright on two legs, and that if the professionals have taken it away for themselves, then it's time the amateurs took it back. We don't even sing the national anthem anymore. That's left to some soloist out of the world of professional singers to do it for us. It's a performance, one we don't join because we ain't got what it takes to sing. 
As a nation, we can sing Happy Birthday, Jingle Bells, America the Beautiful, Three Blind N N Mice, and a few other nursery rhymes. And once a year, we'll stumble through something we can't even spell, much less sing. Old Hang Sign is what it sounds like. And that's about it except for one other song, which may just be our real national anthem. Before I tell you its name, let me tell you how it came to be. Better yet, I'll tell you how to get to the very place where it was composed. Fly to St. Joseph, Missouri, rent a car, head due west on Highway 36 for about 200 miles across Kansas until you reach the little town of Athol in the Solomon River Valley. Ask directions to the farm of Pete and Ellen Rust. It's a mile further west, eight miles north, and three-fourths of a mile west again. The West Beaver Creek runs through the Rust's farm, and near the headwaters of the creek, hidden in a grove of trees, is a rough log cabin. The Rusts are real nice people and will be glad to show you the cabin. In return, you should contribute to the fund to maintain and restore it, because this is sacred ground, the headwaters of American song and the American psyche, what once was known as the Western Frontier. I recommend that you sit alone on the grass in front of the cabin for a while, as did the man who built it 128 years ago. It would be more now. His journey wasn't unlike the one you just made across the Great Plains of Kansas. He came here from Indiana in 1871 by foot and horseback to this place just 20 miles from the geographic center of the U.S., and he came alone to get away and start over somewhere out west. His first wife had died of plague, his second from complications after childbirth, and his third wife from injuries suffered in an accident. His fourth marriage, made in haste to give his children a mother, was a bitter disaster. In his misery, he turned to alcohol, which seriously affected his capacity to carry out his life and work. In desperation, he sent his children to live with relatives in Illinois and left his wife for a destination unknown. The man who came this long way to build this tiny cabin so far from civilization was himself a civilized man, well-educated, a doctor. And not just an ordinary doctor, but a trained surgeon, also a musician who sang and played the fiddle. He knew literature well enough to quote long passages from great books and loved words well enough to write poetry. What he needed now was a place to put down roots and recover from sorrow and failure. He was looking for a place to call home. He dug in here on his homestead a long way from anywhere and built his cabin with his own hands. While he had indeed escaped from one set of troubles in Indiana, his new life had its own serious hardships. For all our romantic notions about the good life on the great American frontier, the Kansas Plains were not paradise. Fierce cold, deep snow, wild winds in winter. Fierce heat, deep dust, and tornadoes in summer. Creeks and rivers that flooded in the spring. Prairie fires, rattlesnakes, plagues of grasshoppers, and a mysterious horse disease that wiped out half of the horse population. The Native Americans were fighting a last-ditch battle for their way of life and often gave no quarter in their desperation. Then there were all the problems of distance from supplies and distance from help in time of need. It was a hard place to make go of a new life. Worse if one had a serious alcohol problem, as did this man. Tough, too, if one got called out in the worst weather to ride long miles to amputate gangrenous feet or dig bullets and arrows out of patients who had no means to pay for the services of a surgeon. Brewster M. Higley, the seventh MD, was his name. Despite the hardships of his life, he found time to sit on a stump in the sunshine in front of his cabin in the silence of that place and write poetry about open country and clear skies and the great joy of feeling at home at last. He was not one of those whom adversity destroys, rather one of those whose virtues and strengths are catalyzed by tough times. Brewster Higley was one of those who would sing in hell itself. One fall, he wrote down some verses about his sense of well-being, filed them away between the pages of a book, and forgot about them. In the spring, a patient who had come to his cabin browsed through the doctor's books as he was being treated, found the poem, read it aloud, and urged the doctor to get it set to music. Doc Higley took his patient's advice and carried that poem with him to Smith Center, Kansas, to share with his young friend Dan Kelly, the local druggist. Kelly had been a bugler in the Civil War, played several other instruments, and liked to compose songs. He took the doctor's poems with him that night when he went to see his girlfriend, Lulu Harlan. They sat together on the couch and made music together. Lulu's two brothers, Clarence and Eugene, joined in with the fiddle and the guitar, and before long, a song was born. If you could be transported across time and space to the Harlan's home one Friday night in April 1873 to Smith Center, Kansas, you could join right in with the premier performance of the new song. They called it My Western Home, but you would know it better as Home on the Range. And you would probably sing your lungs out because if there's one song you likely know by heart, this is it. Home on the Range is our real national anthem. Frederick Jackson Turner would agree. 
His whole frontier theory of American history is summarized in the spirit of that one song. The song is larger than that, however. Millions of millions of people of all over the world can sing it with you, people who have never seen Kansas or buffalo or deer or antelope, but who understand what the word home means and who are tired of discouraging words and who yearn for clear blue skies and a fine day away from the endless traffic of life. Brewster M. Higley the Seventh M.D. moved on from Kansas in time because of his age and his health. Ever the optimist, he married once again and lived happily with his wife, Sarah. She was the home he had been looking for. When she was 67 and he was in his 90th year, she passed away. He followed her not long after. Died of grief, his family said. They're buried side by side in the final peace and quiet of a small cemetery in Shawnee, Oklahoma, where seldom is heard a discouraging word and the skies are not cloudy all day. Let's pray. Almighty God, we lift up our many concerns. We pray for our church members who are not feeling well tonight, who are recovering from surgery or treatments, who are facing those who are in pain, who are in emotional despair because they're lonely or scared or angry. We lift up the other people in our lives that we know of who are sick from COVID-19, who are struggling with other things, with work, with home, problems, with school. We lift up our country as well, a very troubled nation in a troubled time, and we pray for true peace to come and harmony and a new beginning, a, a do-over, Lord, to, to go back to the best parts of the American life together, to recuperate and recover those and to get out of this rut of hateful talk and constant division and bickering and fighting and all of the things that are wearing us down. God, we thank you so much that you see us right where we are right now in the midst of our pain and our struggles and our doubts in the midst of a wilderness as wild as those great plains were back in the 1800s. Thank you for not forgetting us and for never forgetting us. Forgive us for those times that we despair and forget that you're there and begin to doubt your existence or your goodness. Help us to choose to set our eyes on you and your promises. Help us to choose joy and peace and hope when that little voice comes in our head and tells us that none of those things are possible anymore. Thank you for loving us. We confess that we need you, God, more than we ever have before. Fill us with your Holy Spirit and renew us in your truth. Give us the hope, give us the comfort that will heal our hearts where they have been broken or are breaking. Give us the courage just to face another day. We'll take one day at a time, God, knowing that with you in front of us and behind us, we have nothing to fear ever. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good night, friends, and a better tomorrow. And God bless.